Turn to the book of Matthew this morning. Matthew chapter 14. It's great to see all of you here. We have many guests that are here this morning. We welcome you to our services. And again, we normally would shake hands and greet everybody, but today we're just changing that up a little bit, obviously. Uh, the best way to go. And, um, but we welcome all of you. We thank you for being here. And we're so glad that you've chosen to come and worship our God here with us today. And uh, we want to lift up the name of Jesus Christ and to encourage all of you, those of you here and those watching on Facebook, that God is in control. He's watching over us. And uh, though this, there's probably never been a time like this uh, in our country um, where... Um, We've had so many different changes with the NBA, the NCAA, all the stores. I found out this morning Nike's closing their stores for now. And it just a lot of closures, but uh, we're thankful uh, that God is still on the throne. Nothing has changed for God. And, uh, and so we look to Him. And we're going to talk about Jesus this morning, the one that can see us through any storm, any trial, any difficulty. Um, God will see you through. He's with you. And as you receive him as your savior, this week was my spiritual birthday, March 12, 1972. I accepted Christ as my savior. I was in church that morning with my, my brother Vince, Rochester Hills Baptist Church in Rochester, Michigan. And, uh, and the invitation came for folks to come and receive Christ. I was seated on the second row, I left my seat, and that morning I received Jesus as my Savior. So I was born into the family of God. So what that means is I'll never die. I'm never going to die. Um, I have eternal life. So when I take my bre last breath here, I'll take my first breath in heaven. I'm never going to die. I'll leave this earth, but Rich Sidlowski will never die. We'll be separated but I'm never going to die. And that's what we have in Jesus Christ. That's the wonderful news of the gospel. We, they sang about the cross, the choir did. And the cross of Jesus Christ, the death that he, uh, uh, that he died, the blood that he shed, gives us the opportunity to have our sins forgiven to be uh, inherit eternal life. We find here in, in Matthew chapter 14... In verse 22, the Bible says, In straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and go before him uh, to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love for us. Bless now our time and your word and this day. And we love you, God. We look to you now. We ask you to speak to every heart. If there's one here that knows not Christ in a personal way, uh, I pray, Father, they would, uh, through the message and through the Holy Spirit, understand that you love them and you sent your Son to die for them. And you'll give them eternal life if they'll open their heart to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you. you may be seated. We had the opportunity to go to Israel two years ago. And uh, this last September, we went to Israel again, took a delegation from our church joined others from around the country and, uh, and uh, went and spent 10 days in the Holy Land and uh, visiting the places where our Savior walked and to actually walk on the same street that he walked on, to see the place that he was crucified, um, to go out onto the Sea of Galilee, which our story um, uh, is, uh, takes place today, this area right here, this picture that you see up on the, the television screen is a picture of the Sea of Galilee. Now that's from one side to the other. That's how wide the Sea of Galilee is. It's not a big, like the ocean, like we have. Um, and so to go from this side to the other side is not that far of a distance. However, they tell us that um, because of the mountains and because of the way the Sea of Galilee lies, um, storms can come up very quickly in this, on this lake. It's called Lake Gennesaret also. The Sea of Tiberias 
Tiberius sits on this, on this uh, body of water also. So it has several names. But um, um, this area here is where Jesus actually fed uh, his disciples breakfast. Those of you who know the Bible, you remember they all went back to fishing. And Jesus is on the seashore. He's risen from the grave. His disciples have all departed. They've gone back to their old way of life because he was crucified and they thought it was over. But it wasn't over. And, uh, and though, though they went back to fishing, can you imagine that after three years of being with Jesus, they saw his miracles. They saw him feed the 5,000. They participated. They saw him heal the blind, raise the dead. And yet... When he died and was buried, they thought it was over. They thought he was gone. And he even told them he would, he would rise again. And so even his own disciples doubted. Even his own disciples, I mean, they were fearful. They weren't there at the cross. They were afraid for their lives. And, um, and yet God in his grace comes back to them. And he's, he's way, he goes to the, the seashore and uh, he, he feeds them breakfast and takes care of them and gives them the mandate. You understand, those disciples, those 11 disciples, they added one, they had to put them back to 12, they took the Great Commission, it's called, and took the, the gospel, the, light, the, the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ to all the known world at that time. It was an amazing thing. And you see, we're here in church because of these men's faith. We're having a baby dedication today. And when we dedicate a baby, we're dedi- you know, the parents are dedicating themselves to teaching uh, Tommy about Jesus, teaching him about God. They're mandating that, hey, our home is going to be a home that talks about Jesus Christ. So they're just following the great commission, the command of God to teach their children about Jesus, as the scriptures teach us. And so um, as we look at our passage this morning, I want you to understand that no matter what storm comes, Jesus is there for you. No matter what difficult, there's storms. This is a great storm. We don't ignore the storm. It's uh, and, and much of the storm is the panic of the people, the uh, the worry um, uh, about food and the raiment and so on. And so, you know, it's uh, it's a difficult thing. But we know that God uh, will meet every need. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning. As we think about Jesus Christ, the Bible says here that many people had come to hear Jesus. Now, they would often speak, when we were in, when we were in uh, Israel, we stood on the, a hillside, and uh, we had one of the guys, the younger guys ran all the way down to the bottom of this hill, and he, could, he talked to us up this hill. It was like an amphitheater. And that's when Jesus spoke, he spoke in an area where everybody could hear him, multitudes could hear him. They would be sitting down on the grass, and he would speak. But it was amazing how that Peter was his name. He went down, ran all the way down, way far away, probably maybe a football, maybe 75 yards away. And he just talked, and we could hear him clearly. And so that just has concluded on the seashore of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus said, hey, we're going to go over to Gennesaret. So men, go get on the boat, go get on the ship, and head out. And the Bible says here that Jesus departed to pray. You see, at the end of the day, Jesus often would send his men on, and he would go and, uh, by himself and pray. Now here he was, God. But he was God and man. He was 100% God and 100% man. And uh, he would go, as a man, he would go apart and pray. 
And so that's what's happened here. He's constrained them. He said, hey, get on the ship, head to the other side, and uh, I'll join you. The Bible says in verse 23, and when he sent away the, mul the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. So Jesus is alone again. He's praying. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. So this is at the darkest point of the night, the fourth watch of the night. It's about 3 a.m. The disciples are on the ship. A storm has come up, a great storm. The winds are howling, and a lot, a lot of times the way the winds blew, it kind of made a circle around, so the waves were... Waves were crashing into each other. So when you have waves coming this way and waves coming this way, when they hit, it makes even a bigger wave. You can't just, you know, uh, go right, just right into the waves and stuff. The waves are like crashing all around. And they're nervous. A great storm came up. But I want you to know that in the midst of the storm, God is there. And God uses the storm. He uses the storm. This storm here was in the, came at the middle of the night, at the darkest time. And uh, sometimes in our lives, we face dark times. We feel alone. We feel like nobody's there. But uh, we, I, I want you to know this morning, church, that we're never alone. We're never alone. God's, says, God's word says, I promise to never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus is always there. He's with you. Um, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, again, this is a promise from God's word. This isn't what I say. This is from the Bible. This verse here is right out of the Bible. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Be content with what with such things as ye have. For he said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. By the way, the, the path to the joyful Christian life, the path to peace, now this is a difficult time because we're, we're dealing with this virus and we're dealing with all the, the economy and we're dealing with the unsurety of many areas. But most of the time, things are good. But the Bible says here in the first part of this verse, let your conversation or life be without covetousness. We don't want to covet other things. Want more than we have. But be content with such things as you have. You see, the key to a path of, of uh, joy and peace in life is contentment. Being content with what you have. If you're never happy with what you have, then you're, you're never going to be happy because you're always going to want more. And, uh, and so we have to be careful about that. We want to be driven. We want to want success. We want to have uh, God's blessings or the world's blessings. In America, we're just blessed with a lot of things. But uh, you need to learn, and, and, and you find this contentment through Jesus Christ. And so many people, many people are poor that have a lot because they're not content. Many people are poor but are rich because they're content with what they have and they enjoy it. They enjoy their life. They enjoy the things that they, that they have and they've learned to be content. And so I'm thinking as we pass through this storm, maybe we just need to be content with what we have. Maybe we need, because the economy's dropping, um, and uh, many people are, are, are facing that part of this storm, and, uh, but we need to look to God and know that He's there. No matter how dark the darkness gets, He is there. Some of the darkness of this time that we're facing is, you know, there's not, no more NBA, 
and uh, uh, no more NCAA uh, basketball. So think about this. Ladies, think about this. Your husband has no basketball to watch over the next month. Now that's going to be really the March Madness right there, amen? It's like, what are you going to do with your husband? You, you actually have to talk to him now, you know? It's like, and uh, uh, you don't have anything to distract him. While you're out spending money, your husband knows it now. Okay, no, you're not going to the store. By the way, there's nothing at the store. And uh, so it works both ways, ladies. Don't? And uh, so this, we're really in for the March Madness into the home, you know what I'm saying? What are you going to do? And uh, what are we, you know, so we don't have the sports. No Masters Golf Tournament. I, lo I always look forward to the Masters Golf Tournament. And uh, my wife became an avid uh, a golf fan years ago during her uh, she had a stem cell transplant so she had to stay home for a hundred days so she learned to watch golf she loved Jordan Spieth I think she would have adopted him and I wouldn't have minded after he signed that hundred million dollar contract I <laughs> go ahead and adopt him honey we could use the money and uh, I loved she loved to watch the Masters golf tournament oh she just and uh, she learned to love golf and many of you love golf, but it's, it's not going to happen. But wouldn't it be wonderful if at the time that you could spend over the next month watching basketball, watching the NCAA, you just spent more time with God, reading your Bible. A good thing to do in reading your Bible, your Bible has 66 books in it. There's a book called Proverbs. And Proverbs has 31 chapters in it. And you can read one proverb a day. So today is the 15th. You read Proverbs 15. Um, it'll give you wisdom. It'll give you wisdom for life. We need wisdom. You, you, you could read the book of Psalms. Psalm, the Psalms of David, and the different Psalms there that you can read kind of deals with God's compassion towards you. And compassion. We all need compassion, right? And uh, we need wisdom, but we need compassion. And so read Psalm 15 today. And then the book of Acts is about the Acts of the Apostles, actually doing it, your actions for God, telling others about Jesus, helping others. And when you do that, sometimes you'll face some tribulation. You'll, you'll face some adversity at times. But that's okay. That's just the way it is. And so what? You, you just shake off the dust of your feet. If somebody rejects my gospel tract that I give them, I never get mad at them. I just pray for them. And I pray that they'll come to know Christ. Because I tell you, God loves them. He cares about them. Um, he cares about them even though they reject him. Our God's an amazing God. He loves us. He, he penetrates the rejection. He, re he penetrates that wall that's put up around us in this world. And he loves you today. Whatever you have keeping you from God, keeping you from his love, just, just break down the wall. Just let go of what that, uh, of whatever it is that's keeping you from Jesus. Because he loves you. My brother Jim was 59 years old when he came to Christ. And my brother Jim, I was in the, I've been in the ministry for 40 years. And uh, my brother Jim would not let me talk to him about Jesus. Don't even talk to me. He owned a company. He was a millionaire. He had money. He had three different homes, one in Florida. Had a nice home in Rochester Hills. Had a nice place on Lake Columbia. And so, I mean, he just had a good life. He golfed. Every Saturday, every Sunday, went golf, and his wife went to church. And um, when she passed away, my mom passed away, and then my his wife passed away. We had the funeral on Friday. On Sunday, Jesus, uh, Jim accepted Jesus as his Savior, and we prayed for him for twenty five years, thirty years. Never thought he would come to Christ. On that day, he did. He accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. 
Matter of fact, in the limousine after the funeral on Friday, I heard later on that he told Marge's sister and brother-in-law about Jesus. He's telling about Jesus. He's not even a Christian. Yeah, this is Jesus can save you. Jesus can give you eternal life. And Marge is in heaven. And they're like, you know, listen, looking at him. And, and believe me, when, Jesus, when, when Jim got saved at the age of 59, he became the most dedicated Christian in the world. I mean, now he went from being unsaved to being a Pharisee. You know, every, if you didn't do exactly what the church said, you were somehow not right with God. I said, Jim, whoa, let go. Okay, you know, because that's the way he was. Whenever, whatever it was, he did it full, full blast, you know? And uh, he used to say, well, I'm not ready to be a Christian yet. I'm not ready for that. And I said, you know, I never said it to him. But the truth is, you don't get ready to become a Christian. Jesus, you, we're never ready. And the older we get, we're self-sustained. I don't need anybody. I don't need anything outside of what I have, my gifts and abilities. I can make money. I can make my way, you know. And, um, but he became a Christian. And today he's a born-again Christian, lives in Rochester, Michigan, and goes to church every Sunday. He's a faithful believer. He used to be real stingy with money. But, uh, man, when he got, became a Christian, he just would give his money away. And he gave, brought his, his son-in-law was a pastor in Massachusetts. He bought the steeple for the church. I mean, the church grew. It was a new, new church plant. He put thousands and thousands of dollars into that church. It was a wonderful thing. And everybody that knew him knew that only God could do that. Only God could do that. He, he was born again and born in the family of God. And I love him and I'm thankful for him. He's still mean to me, but I'm thankful for him. Amen. He's still... He's still uh, I tell him about something we're going to do at the church. He says, no, you sure? You're going to do that? We, we're going to put modulars out here. And he said, Eric tried to put modulars in in Northern California. They wouldn't let them. Are you sure that government's going to let you put those modulars in? And by the grace of God, we got seven modulars put out here in the city of Banning in, in Riverside County in the state of California. We have a lawyer that's very famous in our country. He's defended hundreds and thousands upon thousands. He was here. He said, Pastor Sadlowski, it's a miracle that you have those modulars on your property. He said, right now we have 300 lawsuits from churches with cities that don't want them to have modulars on their property. And uh, God gave us that victory. And they looked nice and were thankful. We got them for a dollar apiece from the city of San Bernardino. And I said, that's too much, a dollar apiece? <laughs> Couldn't you get them down to 50 cents? Come on. Of course, we've remodeled them. But it's interesting to just to see God, God do a work. God comes in the darkness. In the darkest hour, these disciples, these are his men. They're doing the work. They're living, for, they're living for God, and the storm comes up in their life. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 12, Then spake Solomon and said this, The Lord said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. It doesn't matter how dark things look, God's there. He's there. Um, the scripture says in Psalm 139, verses 11 and 12, If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be a light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day, and the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter in the darkest hour or the lightest hour, when things are good or things are bad, God's face is still upon you. When you walk down a dark room, there's just, you just... You need a little bit of light, and you can begin to see everything around you. You open your eyes. You can see 
everything around you. And so in your house, you know where everything is. You know, in my house, I have the bed here, the dresser here, I have another dresser here. So I can get up with my eyes closed and use the restroom in the middle of the night. I can go down the hall. This morning, forgive me, Jesus, I got up, I went ahead to get some water out of the fridge. And of course, you can't get water out of the fridge without getting a piece of candy. Amen, in the middle of the night. <laughs> Lord, help me. And uh, got some candy there. Actually, I brought the candy bag back to the room. I said, you know, I'm sick of walking down that long hallway in the middle of the night. Put it right there, some C's candy. Just for the darkness, amen. But you know, what happens if, if you change the house around, you move to a new place, and things change a little bit, in the darkness, you have to feel your way a little bit more, right? And so right now, things are a little different in this world. Things don't feel the same. And I'll be honest with you, I, I'm a, I was a little apprehensive, you know, on Friday. You know, we're thinking we, got, we have a school here. We have three, 300 people on this property every day. We have church here. You're here to worship. And we have, you know, we, all of our senior citizens and people that I know that they're going to be depending on us. We have to help them. And I believe this church, over this next three weeks or however long this lasts, we will become a stronger church. We will love each other more. Because we're going to help you. We're going to help the people who are at home today. Those of us that can will help. We're going to help all those school families who are worried. And uh, we're, going to, we're going to help them. They need food, we'll get that food to them. If they need toilet paper, I was thinking about speaking this morning on the issue of the tissue and just, uh, <laughs> just that toilet paper, you know. That would be a great topic. The issue of the tissue, and people are fighting over toilet paper. And let that toilet paper go, you know what I'm saying? Whatever. And, uh, but we're not going to speak on that this morning. And I don't want you going home saying, what did, what did you learn today? Well, we talked about the issue of the tissue, and believe me, we saw it down at Walmart. And, um, and we got the water of the Word, the Word of God. So Jesus comes in times of darkness. It was a disastrous times, Mark chapter 6 and verse 48. The Bible says they were toiling and rowing. I mean, they're rowing. They're rowing that boat. On a calm sea, it's no problem. But they're toiling. The winds are contrary. Everything's contrary. In church, in life, everything's contrary. Everybody's going through this together. You understand? Everybody. It doesn't matter what you believe or who you believe. We believe in Jesus Christ. We know he's with us. We know, uh, but everybody's going through it. It doesn't matter what political party you're a part of. Everybody in America is going through this. Everybody's going through the storm. Every, the, the, everybody's facing the same thing. You understand? There's toiling going on, but I'm here to tell you that in the midst of that problem, in the midst of the toiling, Jesus Christ is there. Because we see here, they're toiling and they're rowing. And it doesn't look good. It looks like they're going to sink. But in the midst of that storm, in the midst of the toil, he comes walking on the water. Notice again with me in chapter 14. In verse 26, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled. They troubled. Oh, well, verse, let's read verse 25 first. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the, on the sea. So here's Jesus. It's about 3 a.m. He's done praying. He, he's walking out to get on the boat. He's walking on the sea. He's walking on the water. And uh, when they see him, they cry out. They think it's a ghost. They're in the midst of the sea. Here comes somebody. You could see him walking far away. I remember when we were younger, we used to go to a place up in, uh, in Michigan 
we'd go down a dirt road. It was a dark road, and there was a, there was a legend about some wild man that, with an ax that was there, and, and it would get you. As stupid teenagers did, we went down that road. And uh, I remember I let Ronnie DeSantis was on the roof of the car. He's laying on the roof of the car. People were getting out of the car, climbing up on top, laying on it, because it was scary out there. Well, Rich Selevsky, my best friend, he, he got off the car. He's way out back there. And all of a sudden, I'm looking in the rearview mirror. I could see with the lights of the rear, view, of the, the rear lights, the red, and Selevsky's running down the road. DeSantis is up on top of the car. And he turns around and he sees him running. He thinks this is the guy with the ax, <laughs> you know. And he's screaming, Ronnie is, I'm up driving here. Ronnie's face is down over the windshield saying, go faster. He had a high voice. He was like the toughest kid in the whole city. He had a real high voice. So now he's standing on the front hood, looking at me in the windshield, looking up, looking down, looking up. Go faster, help, he's gonna get me. You know, it was Slepsky. He comes, so I slowed down. He runs up, runs up, runs up, and finally DeSantis sees it's one of us, and he's like, I'm gonna kill all you guys. <laughs> So that's kind of how these guys feel. They see Jesus walking. Who is that? Who's walking on the sea? It's a ghost. Not only we're in the midst of this storm, if the storm doesn't get us, the ghost is going to get us. What did we do? And Jesus, the Bible says in verse 27, but straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, it is, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. It's me. You see, in the midst of the storm, when Jesus was approaching, they were still afraid. They didn't know it was him. But he said, it's me. It is, be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And i got to tell you, church, he's right there with you. Jesus says, be of good cheer this morning. Be not afraid, for I'm with you. Now, Peter always had, he always had this trouble of speaking out of turn. He spoke before he should. You know, if you read the scriptures, you see that Peter was, sometimes was offensive. Sometimes he'd say things. You know, when they came to arrest Jesus that night, Peter takes the sword out and swings it, tries to cut one of the soldier's head off. The soldier ducks, he cuts his ear off. And, P and Jesus says, Peter, let it go. Jesus reached down, picks up that guy's ear, and puts it back on him and heals him. The guy's here to arrest Jesus. And Peter's like, no, he tries to cut his head off, clips his ear. And Jesus says, this, Peter, I don't need you. Peter, it's okay. So Peter says, Lord, if it's really you, bid me walk on the water. So Jesus says, come, come on. So here's Peter. He steps out of that boat and he begins to walk on the water and he's walking towards Jesus. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Jesus, Jesus is walking on the water, but now Peter is. But Peter, as he walked on the water towards Jesus, he began to feel the wind. He began to see the waves. And he took his eyes off Jesus, and he looked over here, and he looked over here. And the moment he took his eyes off Jesus, the Bible says he began to sink. He began to go down. And I think the, the thing that we can take away from this church is just let's just keep our eyes on Jesus. The storm's here, but he's here. And we just got to keep our eyes on him. Keep walking in Christ. Keep our eyes upon Christ. How do you do that, Pastor? You read the Bible. This is all about Jesus. This is God's owner's manual. You understand? He created us. He knows what we need to do in the midst of the storm. And so Peter began to sink. Verse 29 and. He said, come, and when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. 
And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. Now see, if this would have been you or me, when Peter begins to sink, and be, Lord, save me, we just said, okay, just go ahead and go down. Let's let him go under the water a little way. <laughs> you, know, you and I would just watch him sink, right? You know what I'm talking about. Some of you parents, you tell your kids, don't do this, don't do this, and then they disobey you and they start sinking. They make a bad decision. And you say, honey, how long are we going to let them sink before we get them out of this problem? Right? Ah, oh, they made a bad choice. But Jesus immediately, all right, come on, Peter. Now, the amazing thing is, Peter, he lifts, he touches his hand, he lifts him up, and they walk back together. He walks back with him, and he tells him thou, that thou art of little faith. All he had to do was look at Jesus, keep his eye on Jesus, and trust him. And I'm telling you today, in Jesus Christ, look to him and trust him. He loves you, Christian. He knows, he knows what's going to happen tomorrow. This didn't catch God by surprise. This, this virus, this economic downturn, the Bible says of itself, thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So I read this book today. It gives me answers for today. I'm looking to Jesus. It's a light into my path. And so as I read this Bible every day, God guides me down this path called life. And he knows what's going to happen to you a week from now, a month from now. <clears throat> Little Tommy Freeman, God already has a plan for him. He's a baby. The baby's in the nursery. God already has a plan for him. And so we just follow the plan through the Bible. God's love for us. And so God uses the storm. God sometimes tests us by the storm. He tests us. He says, listen, it is I. Be of good cheer. Be not afraid. God's in control. You see, God gives us a message of peace. It's found in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. We have peace. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You see, we have the peace of God. My wife had multiple myeloma. It's a terrible cancer, you know. And uh, my brother-in-law, Pat, has that cancer right now. He's up in the state of Washington. And do you know what my brother-in-law, Pat, has? He's just retired from being a pastor for 35 years. He's about 67 years old. My brother-in-law, Pat, with multiple myeloma, has the, has the disease, the coronavirus. He was in the hospital. And he's home now, and he's doing better. He's doing better. You get the picture? He's doing better. You see, through the midst of it all, he has the peace of God. Multiple myeloma, now the coronavirus. But he has the peace. I'm telling you, the man has the faith. He has faith. He believes God. And God, I believe, is going to see him through. And so we just look to God. We don't know. We don't know, but we, what we do know is that the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. Pat has the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. Shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So Christian today, let, let God keep your heart and your mind. You have peace. God's in control. He's going to meet every need in your life. And the question is this. You know, do you know Christ as your own personal Savior? I grew up in a Christian home. My mom and dad took me to church when I was a little boy. But I never, ever put my faith and trust in just Jesus until I was 15. 
So I knew the Bible verses. I knew the Bible stories. But I never had the born-again experience. I never accepted Christ. You see, everybody, in order to get to heaven, needs to have two birthdays. My physical birthday is February 27th, 1957. That was this, the day that this world got a whole lot better. Because I was here, little Richie. No longer little Richie, but still Richie. Amen. And uh, so the family, oh, there he is, the youngest of eight kids to Gabe and Helen Sidlowski. And everybody was happy till I grew up a little bit and my older brothers and sisters were mean to me. They make fun of me. You know why they made fun of me? Because I was so skinny. Can you imagine that? I was so skinny, they made fun of me. And uh, you know what I did? I gained weight. This comes to my family. I said, no, you're not going to make fun of me. And, uh, but then March 12, 1972, I went to church. I heard the pastor preach about how God loved me, how he gave himself for me, how that if I trusted in him, I could have eternal life. And that day I opened my heart to Jesus and I was born into God's family. And so now I have two families. I have my mom and dad. I have my, have my wife and family, children. I have my earthly family, but I have my heavenly family. You see, we're all here by the grace of God, and we're all born into God's family. That's why we call each other brothers and sisters, because we're all here because of the blood of Jesus Christ. He's our heavenly Father. He shed his blood so our sins could be forgiven. So when we accept Jesus, we become brothers and sisters. Amen? I told somebody I married my sister. It didn't sound good. Amen? No, wait, wait, wait. That didn't sound good. She's my sister in Christ. See? And there's a bond. There's a bond of love because we have the same spiritual father. And so this morning, I'm here to tell you that God loves you. I'm here to tell you in this world, we're finding out that you really can't trust the world. You can lose it all like that. And we don't know where this is going to stop. But we do know this, God's in control. And um, if, you've ne if you're not sure, 100% sure that you're on your way to heaven, you can know that for sure. Be not afraid. Look to him. Open your heart to Jesus Christ. None of us are perfect. There's none righteous, no, not one. As I said, I grew up in a good family, good home. I was a pretty good kid. And, uh, but I needed Jesus. And uh, I realized that I was not perfect. The Bible says, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So Jesus died for me though I was a sinner, though I wasn't perfect. And I opened my heart to him. And God saved me. And I'm, I'm here this morning to tell you God loves you. Open your heart to him. The church doesn't save you. This church doesn't save anybody. This book, the Bible, tells us about a God who loves you and died upon the cross for your sins. And the Bible says, but God commended his love toward us in that while we are sinners, Christ died for us. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And it's through Jesus. It's a gift. It's a gift from God. I can't give you the gift, but he can. He can give you the gift. He knows your heart. And so if you're here and you're not sure, you're on your way to heaven, just receive it. Receive his gift. Receive his love. You see, all of us were like Peter at one time. We had faith in other things, you know. We got our eyes off Jesus. I have this and this. I don't need God. But now we all need him. And so open your heart to him. He loves you today. And uh, be not afraid. And so let's look to him. He secures us. He gives us salvation in the midst of our storms. And uh, the, Lord, the Lord reached out his hand uh, to Peter and the Bible says, and when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. The moment that he, he, Peter came out, they walked back together. The moment Jesus stepped inside the boat, the wind ceased. 
There was no more storm. And see, maybe this morning Jesus is outside of your boat, so to speak. Let him in the boat. And the storm will cease. He controls the storm. Because it doesn't matter what's going on out here. You could have everything good out here. In your heart, there's a storm. Come to Jesus today. Let him in the boat. Open your heart to him. And he'll come in. And he'll be your savior today. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your love for us.